Well, good morning, saints. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. You know, the Bible calls us saints. And I know Joy mentioned that if you're trying to find a perfect person, you're not going to find them. That's true. I stand before you as a sinner saved by grace. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Corinthians. We're going to be reading uh, verses 1 through 8. Chapter 13, I'm sorry. Verses 1 through 8. And as you all know at this point, we've been covering this series on the epistles. And Pastor Jose has been guiding us through these different themes and motifs that the, that the epistles have been um, have for us today, right? And today specifically, we're going to be continuing with that series focusing on 1 Corinthians and the importance of love and why love is important for us today as Christians. But before I get into that, before we read the scriptures and we pray, I'd like to share with you a short story. You know, one of my, my favorite authors uh, in the area of spiritual disciplines and spiritual formation is the late Henry Nouwen. And in one of his books, I, wrote, I read this short story, and I liked it. And I said, I'm going to um, share this during the sermon on Sunday. The river faced a tall wall. It didn't give up and kept pushing until it carved a canyon through the wall. The river, now bigger and stronger, reached a huge forest. And it said, I'll push through, through these trees. And that's what it did. Eventually, the river arrived at the edge of a vast desert under the hot sun. I'll get through this desert, it thought. But as it flowed into the desert, the sand started to soak up all its water, turning the river into a small mud pool. At that moment, the river heard a voice from above, and it said, just surrender. Let me help you. The river responded, here I am. You know, this beautiful story of determination and eventual surrender reminds us of an important truth that we can push, we can strive, and we can try to achieve success on our own, but we fall short when we rely on our strength alone. The story shows us that we need to surrender at times to something much greater than ourselves. And this is what the Apostle Paul is teaching us in this chapter and these verses that we're about to read this morning. Just as the river had to learn how to surrender to something greater than itself, we also must recognize that there comes a time in our life where our efforts and our strength is meaningless without love. And this is the main point that I want to communicate to you. Spiritual gifts and even great acts of sacrifice are meaningless without love. Love is the foundation of our faith, and it is the true measure of our Christian life. Spiritual gifts and even great acts of service, as we're about to read as the Apostle Paul is writing to us, are meaningless if we do not have love, because love is the measure of our Christian faith. It is the measure of our Christianity. So let's, let's expound the scriptures this morning, and let's be edified by what the Word of God has to say to us this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 8. It says, If I speak in tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. And so the Corinthians were proud people. They were proud of the gifts, of the knowledge, of everything that was available to them through the Spirit. They were proud people. But with that, with that spiritual giftedness, with that knowledge, and with that um, you know, faith that they had, all those spiritual gifts, it turns out that they were using them in a wrong manner. And this, 
And you would think that after the Apostle Paul writes these many letters to the Corinthians, you would think that they would get the hang of it and get their act together. But the truth is, history tells us that they never really did. In fact, about 40 years after the Apostle Paul himself, after he, the Apostle Paul, had passed away, and he eventually you know, passes on the church to the next apostles, there's a, an important figure in history called Clement. And Clement was a disciple, a direct disciple of the apostles themselves. In fact, he was known as one of the first apostolic fathers, meaning that there's a clear succession from the apostles to the next individual, in this case being somebody like Clement. And so Clement, 40 years later, writes another letter to the Corinthians. But he, he's writing to not the original people that received the letter for the first time. He's now writing to the descendants, to the children, to the grandchildren of these people. And guess what? It's almost as if he's copying and pasting what the Apostle Paul wrote in his first letters. And so this letter we know as First Clement, and I'll read it to you. First Clement chapter 46, verses 5 through 7 says, why is there strife and anger and dissension and division and war among you? The question. Or do we not have one God and one Christ and one spirit of grace, which is poured out upon us, and one calling in Christ? Why do we tear and rip apart the members of Christ and rebel against our own body and get worked up to such a frenzy that we forget that we are members of one another? 40 years later, talking to the children and the grandchildren of the first recipients of 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians and all the other Corinthians that probably existed, he's writing to them and he's saying, we got to get back to the basics and we got to focus on what love is and why love is important for us as Christians. So as we explore and eventually we unpack these verses verse by verse, uh, I think that there's a few um, themes that might be important for us to understand to unpack the greater meaning of the direction, the trajectory that the Apostle Paul is taking his message. And the first thing is that love isn't just a feeling. In a modern society that we exist today, we sometimes get in the habit of equating feeling with love. But the Apostle Paul is saying the opposite is true. This is not the case. He's saying, in fact, love is more than just a feeling. Love, in fact, is shown through patience and kindness and selflessness. These are all actions. And secondly, another theme that I think is important for us to understand is that unlike, like, unlike spiritual gifts, which are temporary, as he says, love lasts forever, and it, and it is the basis of Christian behavior. When we talk about Christian formation and how a Christian should act, there's no better summary than love. And then thirdly, Paul explains that love should direct how we use our spiritual gifts. If we are truly spiritually gifted, which we are because God has deposited his Holy Spirit in us, then our gifts or the way that we express our gifts should benefit those around us. This is the benchmark that the apostle paul is setting for us here and that love love is supreme love is supreme so let's let's get an idea how, how he's saying that so what he says in verses one to three is this if i speak in the tongues of men and of angels but have not love i am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal and if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all that I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. So the Apostle Paul begins by mentioning five spiritual gifts, important ones at that. Speaking in tongues, prophecy, knowledge, faith faith, sacrifice, all these important spiritual gifts that must exist in a church. But he makes it clear for some reason that without love, these spiritual gifts mean nothing, mean nothing. They're empty. In fact, he says they're like a clanging cymbal or a noisy gong, right? They just make everybody around them irritable at that point. Have you ever met people like that? When you're around them, you just get irritated for some reason? Hope they're not in here, right? Verse 4, 
Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth, with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, all things, endures all things. And so that, then by doing this, the Apostle Paul is now describing to us what love is and what love is not. If there's ever a time in our society that we need to hear this clearly, it is now. There's a distinction, what love is, what love is not. This is the biblical understanding of what love is, true love. And you would think, well, you know, how does this passage written so many years ago have any relevance today to our modern culture? Well, the truth is that there's a progression in Christian history down from Jesus to the Apostle Paul and to these notable figures I'm going to mention right now, our biblical understanding as Christians has not changed. About 350 years after Jesus' ascension, there was a notable Christian leader and theologian. In fact, he is responsible for shaping the theology of the Western church up until this day, known as Augustine of Hippo. And Augustine, like many of the apostolic fathers and church leaders of that time, he wrote a commentary on 1 Corinthians 2, and this is what he says. Love alone is not oppressed by other men's good fortune, since it is not jealous. Love alone is not elated by its own good fortune, because it is not arrogant. Love alone is not stung by a bad conscience, since it never acts wrongfully. Amid reproaches, it is free from worry. Amid hatreds, it acts to do good. Amid wrath, it is calm. Amid plots, it is innocent. Amid iniquities, it, is, it maintains its innocence. It draws its breath from truth. What could be mightier than love? Mightier not in paying back injuries, but in ignoring them. And not too many years before Augustine, there's another notable figure who's responsible for giving us one of the first translations of the Bible, the Polyglot translation, Origin, about 200 years after Jesus' ascension, and he writes this, Love is patient. If you have patience, which is the fruit of the Spirit, you have it because of love. What is the opposite of kindness? Wickedness. If you behave wickedly towards someone, you do not have love. If you are kind and pleasant to everyone, you have love. Love is not jealous. If you have envy like the envy Cain felt towards Abel, or Joseph's brothers towards him, you do not have love. Loving and being jealous are at odds with each other. So from Jesus to the Apostle Paul to notable figures in the early church to now to this present day, as a community, as Christians, our understanding of love has not changed. Has not changed. In verse 8, love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it too will pass away. And so Paul finishes by exclaiming that love is transcendent. That's one of my favorite words, transcendent. What, that's just a fancy word to say. It goes above and beyond our, our tangible time and space. It's eternal. It's one of our highest values as Christians. It transcends this place, and it endures forever because it's everlasting because God is love. And so the Apostle Paul is saying tongues and, and prophecies and, and healings and all these different uh, miracles and spiritual gifts, they're awesome, but really they're only needed for this earth. What really matters, what really endures, what really sums up all these things is this concept of love. And so for me, it's my conviction that this passage really encourages us, encourages us to examine our actions. It challenges us to a process of self-reflection and self-examination. And if we're not doing that, then we're not really paying attention to the scriptures because that's what the scriptures do. They cause us to say, there's something wrong with me and I need to change it. And I'm cognizant of the fact, I'm aware of the fact that in my own strength, I can't change it. I need the spirit of God to change it for me. And the way that I like to reflect 
is by asking questions, sometimes asking myself questions. This is the action reflection model. And one of the questions I guess I would ask for me and for all of us here is, are we helping others because of obligation or to get ahead or to be noticed? Or are we doing it out of true love, like the Jesus love that's mentioned throughout the Gospels? It's a question that I can't answer for you. I can't, I'm hardly able to answer it myself, right? But it's a question nonetheless that I think is important. And Jesus taught that the greatest commandment is to love God and to love others. When Jesus mentions the greatest commandment of all, he mentions love. Read with me in Matthew chapter 22. We're going to read verses 36 through 40. The Apostle Paul, I mean, Jesus himself, as always, was being tested by all these different people, by the Pharisees and the Sadducees and all these different groups that wanted to trap him. And at one point, they asked him, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment or which is the great commandment in the law? They're testing him. And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and the first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself, because on these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Jesus is saying, if you want to follow the law, if you want to be a righteous person, if you want to do the will of God in your life, then you must love God first, and secondly, you must love your neighbor as well. And so Paul reminds us that it's not just about what we do, but about why we do it. Not about what I do, but why do I do it? And he goes on to explain that love must be the foundation of all of our actions. Think about in your life, this is the reflection aspect. Why do I do the things that I do? Is it motivated by love? Is it motivated by something greater than myself? Or is it motivated by self-ambition and self-promotion? And so this passage, I believe, challenges us to reflect on our priorities. And in today's world where success and fame and recognition are sometimes placed above everything else, Paul teaches us that the top priority should be love. This is an inverted triangle, right? An inverted where love is at the head and ourselves, our self-promotion, our self-gratification, our self-engrandizement is at the very bottom because it means nothing. And so I can't help but to think about the psychological principles, right, when I, when I read this passage. And my, what I mean by this is there's one, a couple of things that come to mind. And the first thing is this construct of emotional intelligence, another fancy word. What is emotional intelligence? Well, Emotional intelligence is the ability to understand and to manage our emotions and to recognize the emotions of others. When there's this aspect of leadership, when there's this aspect of personal, uh, interpersonal relationships, when there's fulfillment in relationships, the research has shown us that people that have high emotional intelligence are reap the benefits of interpersonal relationships, meaning that they have deeper connections, more transparency, and so forth. So when we're emotionally intelligent, intelligent, we are able to recognize not only our own emotions and to manage them properly, which is something hard to do, but we can also recognize the emotions of others. In fact, as I said before, people with strong emotional intelligence are people that are grounded, people that are, that are centered, people that know how to have meaningful relationships and can do so properly. Augustine, the same individual that I mentioned to you in his book, Soliloquies, writes something to this effect. And he says, Lord, let me know myself and let me know thee. When he writes about this in his book, Soliloquies, what he's saying is, God, help me to understand myself so that I may therefore turn to you and know you. As a pastor, as a minister, as somebody that works in a clinical setting as a chaplain, I understand that it's very easy to care for other people. It's very easy to attempt to try to solve other people's problems, at least the perception of it that we have. This is one of the pitfalls of people in the helping professions. But one thing that I've learned over life is it's sometimes harder 
to know ourselves and to help ourselves. It's harder to look in the mirror and to face ourselves for who we really are. We're good at pointing it out in other people. We're good at giving you a plan of care and a treatment plan and saying do this and do that and do this and, and, this, and your problems will be fixed. But when it comes to ourselves, it's sometimes hard to really face the man that's in the mirror. So it's my conviction that introspection plays a big part in the emotional development of our humanity. I've, to I've said this before, that it's impossible for us to grow spiritually if we are stunted emotionally. I'll say that one more time. It's impossible for us to grow spiritually if we are emotionally stunted. What does that look like? Well, you know yourself better than anybody else. How do you manage your anger? How do you manage your, your passions? How do you manage all these different things, right, that the Apostle Paul is talking about? Do you know yourself? Do you know what your triggers are? Do you know the things that make you tick? Do you know yourself fully so that then you can turn to God for help? And sadly, sometimes we don't. Sometimes we never even stop to consider if we know ourselves because it causes anxiety in us. Psychologists talk about two types of motivation. There is the in intrinsic motivation, which is a fancy word to say something that comes from inside of us. And then there is extrinsic motivation, something that comes from outside of us, something that's exterior to us, intrinsic and extrinsic. And so Paul encourages us to be motivated by one of our highest values as Christians, and that is love, something that is intrinsic to us. It's one of our core values, as was mentioned earlier. And he says that all of our actions, if they stem from this core value of ours and it's an intrinsic motivator of ours, then it will reflect in everything that we do. Studies show that when we act out of genuine care for other people, we often experience greater satisfaction and fulfillment. And acts of love, of genuine love and kindness, have been linked to, this is empirical data, it's known through the research at this point, there's no way to refute it, it leads to or is linked to increased well-being in our lives. And it leads to reduced stress. And it also reduced, just as important or more importantly, to deeper and more meaningful interpersonal relationships. Have you ever been stuck in a room, this is not in my notes, but I'm just going off tangent here. Have you ever been stuck in a room with somebody that is talking to you, but is kind of like looking on at the other, like looking behind you, right? Has that, has that ever happened to you? And what does that mean? It means that they're not invested in you, right? It means that they don't really care about this conversation you're having. It's just a transaction. It's not a good feeling for the recipient. What, what I like in my life is authentic relationships. I want you to look at me when you're talking to me and to spend time with me as I want to do with you. But when we don't have that, when we don't have the emotional capacity to give that to somebody, much less to ourselves, it leads to superficial relationships. And that is not good either. And there's a distinction that the Apostle Paul is making between genuine love and behaviors that may seem loving but are actually driven by self-serving motives, such as seeking approval or recognition or avoiding conflict. I'll read that one more time. But there is a distinction between genuine love and behaviors that may seem loving but are actually driven, driven by self-serving motives, such as seeking approval, recognition, or avoiding conflicts. I'll use this example because this is a, a common example. I'm not psychoanalyzing any of you or anybody in this church. I'm trying to do that to myself. But there's a common example of this when it comes to people pleasers or what we know as people pleasing. People pleasers are often are people that go out of their way to help others. And sometimes they do everything that they can to make other people happy. This is the consummate people pleaser or people pleasing person. And often we found that people pleasers are motivated by some extrinsic motivating factors, and that is the need for, the emotional need for external validation. And ultimately, that stems from a fear of rejection. Whether they learn that from childhood, whether they learn that in the development phase, whatever the case might be, a people pleaser needs to be 
validated, and they need to feel like they're accepted and not rejected. And that causes them to do everything that they do to please people and to like people and have people like them and pat them in the back. And I tell you, my friends, this is a vicious cycle. People pleasers may help others, not, uh, not out of a deep sense of help, of love, I'm sorry, but because they want to be liked, avoid criticism, or feel accepted. This is, as I said before, an extrinsic motivating factor, an extrinsic motivation, where the actions are driven by a desire for approval rather than by an intrinsic desire to love. And so Paul's teaching challenges us or challenges this kind of motivation. The Apostle Paul is saying, let our motivations, let our actions, let our love towards one another not be motivated by selfish ambition or anything that uh, creates self-aggrandizement in us that promotes the self, but let it be motivated by an, ex an extrinsic factor, which is love. He reminds us that love must be sincere, not transactional or self-serving. I think we've all been in transactional relationships, and they're not fun. Transactional relationships look like this. I'll do this for you, and you do this for me. If I do this for you, I expect this in return from you. And the moment you don't have fulfilled this transaction, then our relationship is meaningless. That's a transactional relationship. It's not that extreme all the time, but you get what I'm saying. And so Paul's message on love reveals that sometimes we can have what's called a self-serving bias. What does this mean? This is the tendency to see our actions in a way that makes us look good. Have you ever done that before? Where we reorient and reinterpret our actions and say, no, I did it because I'm a kind person. I did it because of this. I did it because of that. When we have a self-serving bias, it's like any other bias, right? We don't know that that's the way, that's what we're doing. We don't know that we're actually acting out of self-interest rather than by genuine care for others. And so the Apostle Paul challenges us, our bias, by giving us this scripture by, by telling the Corinthians and by extension us today and telling us this is what needs to change in your life. Your actions must be motivated by love. And if they're not motivated by love, you need to check yourself at the door and do something about it. Because a self-serving bias or any kind of bias, to be exact, makes it difficult to really understand our true reasons for what we do, which is why introspection and looking inward, as Paul recommends, is really important for us. To spend time with the Lord, and sometimes to spend time with the Lord in quiet, contemplative prayer. What is contemplative prayer? We've lost that tradition as Pentecostals over the years, but the wider church has not. Contemplative prayer means to spend time with the Lord in quietness, which is sometimes difficult for many of us to do, to be quiet. Because our actions, I mean, our words get in the way. Our thoughts, I'm sorry. You know, as a Christian, as a pastor, I've seen this play out several ways in the church, uh, not just in other people, but I've experienced it too. And I use this example, not that it's something that happens here, but I use this example to illustrate the wider a uh, point that the Apostle Paul is making. But imagine someone who regularly helps in the church, somebody that is often helping and giving of themselves and donating their time, which is really important, and doing all these great things that on the surface look amazing. But the moment this individual or these individuals do not receive praise or recognition or feel like their, like their uh, volunteering or their work is not being recognized, the story changes. They begin to feel resentful. They begin to feel angry and rejected and not accepted and not validated. And what does this demonstrate? It demonstrates that sometimes our actions, even our good actions, don't always stem from good intentions or good motivating factors like love. Paul challenges us to go beyond this kind of give and take love. And instead, act out of a sincere place of love, one that expects 
nothing in return. When I love you, when you love me, the, the standard should be that I expect nothing in return. I do this because this is what the Lord has commanded me to do, and I do this because I genuinely love my brother and my sister, and I look out for their well-being as if I'm looking out for the well-being of Jesus himself. And to kind of bring this to a conclusion, I'll call the worship team at this point. It's my conviction that this passage teaches us that love should guide everything that we do. When you reflect in your own life today, let love be the guide of your actions. Let love be the guide of everything that you do in life. And by focusing on true love, checking our motivations, we can then grow as Christians. Because true Christian life, as I've said, as the Apostle Paul has highlighted for us, true Christian love is defined, I mean, true Christian life is defined by love. And without it, everything is meaningless. Without love, everything is meaningless. And so my question for you, my question for myself, my question for us as a church, as a community that is here in this community to directly impact the wider community with the gospel, my question for you and me and for us as a church is this. What areas in our relationships, in our communities, in our workplaces, in our family lives, in our re- and so forth, relationships and so on and so forth, what areas need this kind of love that's more patient and more kind and more genuine? If you're anything like me, the answer would be all of them. All areas in our life need to be filtered through this motivation of love, genuine love, and genuine care. And if you find yourself in this room today, and if you are convicted by the words of the gospel, by the words that we just read, 1 Corinthians 13, verses 1 through 8, if you're convicted by that as I am, then the answer to that conviction is hope in Jesus. The Word of God tells us that God Himself has deposited in us His Holy Spirit. And His Holy Spirit is responsible for generating in us the fruits of the Spirit. Generating in us things that should not be there and replacing them with the things that should. And so my response to that and your response to that is to humble ourselves and to ask for God, ask God for forgiveness and for change. And sometimes God doesn't do an instantaneous change in our lives. Sometimes God doesn't change us from one day to the next. Sometimes that change is progressive, where he begins to point out in us, Edgar, this is what needs to change. Edgar, this is what you need to work in. You have to be intentional in killing sin in your life. I've worked with a lot of people in recovery, and I've seen a lot of addicts go through struggles, relapses, recoveries, relapses, and so forth. And I've learned in that process that sometimes our recovery process is not instantaneous. It requires us to put in the work, and that is the case with sin. We need to put in the work. We need to kill sin. We need to check it at the door and say, not today, sin. You will not enter my home. Let us pray. Lord, Father, I thank you so much for the grace and the richness that we have in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And I thank you above everything else, Lord, for the mercy, for the grace that you have given us and deposited in us through your Spirit. I pray that each one of us here today, you create in us a new person. You generate in us the fruits of the Spirit. Those things that do not that exist in our lives that should not be there, I pray that you help us to remove it. Show us the way to worship you. Show us the way to be live out this title that we have, which is the saints. The ones that have been made perfect in your sight because of the blood of Jesus Christ. I pray that whoever is here that does not know you, that they come to know you, the one and true living God, revealed to us through Jesus Christ. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Amen. If you are one of those people here today, maybe you've never heard the message of the gospel. Maybe you never heard about Jesus, about God. I invite you to come to speak with one of the pastors. We would love to be one of the people responsible for your discipleship and walking you through this process of the spiritual life. Thank you so much for your time and the Lord bless you all.